All right, I'm recording again. This should be fine. I apologize for all the technical issues, everybody. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Okay, I'll do the intro again, Danny. Okay. This feels silly. You want me to do it? No, I got it. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Millsurf World, your podcast about military surplus. This is Aaron, and today I'm joined by Mark, Danny, and Tom. Uh, say hello, everybody. Allie. Hello. Hello. Unfortunately, we recorded a really cool hour of trivia with uh, Tom, uh, and it did not record. So take take our <laughs> thanks, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> so take take our word for it. It was actually really good, and and uh, uh, and Mark lost. Um, oh yeah. Just so we know, everybody knows <laughs> because we have no proof of who won now. White no, washing. Uh, Mark won. I'll, I'll, I'll have his back. He right, what, what was the total uh, score, Tom? I like you, Tom. The, the score was 28 for Mark, 17 for Danny, and 14 for Aaron. Yeah, like well, the norm when I play trivia is to just not get last. Like that's just my goal. <laughs> Shut <so>. up, Danny. <laughs> well, that you were successful. Nice, thanks. <laughs> so in that way, I am a winner. Mm. <laughs> I um, put up some on my website. I put up a couple of uh, trivia things on there if anyone wants to check it out. Yeah, it's uh, millserphq.com, right? Yep. And and Tom is uh, obviously um, welcome to stay uh, for our discussion if you would like to. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you don't uh, mind, I'll We're going to have to have you back on here to yes, redo the, yeah, the trivia. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, uh, that was a very embarrassing thing for me to have to tell everybody. <laughs> That's all right. I have I'll uh, I have some backup things so I'll work on. Okay, so I guess today's podcast is gonna be a little bit shorter than normal, <laughs> unless we can really stretch this one out. Um, so our topic today is uh, the values of a mill serpent. And the reason we have Mark on is Mark. Uh, why don't you tell us about where you used to work? I used to work for a major auction company, uh, Delton Firearms, uh, in New Hampshire called Amoskeg, and I ca- I cataloged primarily military arms, and I know my way about most of them, not to sound arrogant, but I uh, kind of, I catalog, describe them, prepare them for auction, you know, what, and I, I and I'd put a value on them, and this, like I said, describe the condition. I will vouch for Mark. I've known him now for a couple of years, and he really does know his stuff. Um, it's kind of it's kind of crazy how much that you know just off the top of your head random stuff about these guns. Like it's Thank it's you. obvious like a like like a passion, you know, for you. Thank you. All right. So in in a rare moment for Millsurp World, I actually have an outline that we're going to try to follow somewhat. This is a rare moment and I know I'll probably get some people mad at me for trying to trying keep to, to a schedule. Keep us on topic. Uh-huh. So, first off, obvious the first obvious question that came to mind when it when it came to evaluating a, a mill serp is is why bother doing it? And the the reasons I came up with that that I'm sure you guys are aware of are um, for insurance purposes. Uh, for for ex- example, um, the next one would be putting it in a will so that somebody would know, especially family members would know. Um, what it what what it was worth, and then finally, obvi- the obvious one is uh, if you wanted to go sell something, then you would kind of need to know how much you want to put it up for offer. Um, as far as these uh these, does anybody else have any like other ones that can come up with this is why you yeah. want to value it? Those are really good. Like the sale part is pretty big because like so many people, including me, sometimes like will want to sell something. And then not really know like the exact you know like value that it has like a, a good a good you know like a fair market price to to ask for it. Um, so that's a, that's a good one. Um, like me, like personally, um, like I keep a I keep a spreadsheet of all my guns, and I, I put like you know just basic you know make model serial, and then how much I paid, and then like the approximate value. And I've kept this now for like a few years, so like every now and then I have to go back and adjust, you know, the the values because they all, you know, because they all go up. And and I do that mostly kind of like a will, 
uh, it's it's for my wife so that if anything happens to me, here's a catalog, you know, there's a virtual catalog of all my all my guns and, and everything and the values that's worth. Uh, that way she just won't be another, you know, another widow, um, you know, getting getting ripped off. So is it better to piece them out or sell them as a collection? Well, it's probably easier to sell them as a collection, um, but you get more, you know, piecing them out. Typically, if you sold them as a collection, I would assume they wouldn't be going to yeah. an individual. It would be going to like an auction house or a like Which I'm sure, large yeah. distribution place. Like I'm sure marketing classic. exactly a lot of this. And that's typically the way it works. Either an auction house, maybe a gun dealer. Like, did, uh, did you ever see like classic? That, like, classic does that, right? They'll take in large lots from people, right? I think so. I'm not sure, but oh man, Danny's favorite. To, Danny's favorite place, guys. Not to get, yeah, not to get, go down the classic train, but like, just be careful when buying from them, folks. That's all I'll say. Ooh. Like, so kind of what I said about you know my my collection sort of being like uh, like an insurance thing, like me cataloging everything for my wife, like just in case anything happens to me. But like, did you did you see quite a bit of that? Um, at the at the auction house, just kind of like big estates coming in, like people passing and. Oh yes, that's that, that's how that's how it works. A lot of the time, you get a big collection. That's how it would come in. It'd either be that or the person got out of it. You know, a lot of times the widow doesn't have any idea what a lot of the stuff's worth. You know. Did yeah. they? And, did uh, they? Did people usually bother to come up with like lists of stuff, or did they just not track that? It, it depends. Sometimes they did. Sometimes they didn't. Sometimes. Uh, I would say it's from the minority. Really? Wow. That's the short so answer. Most of the time, right? somebody would, would they just show up with like a like a pickup truck bed full of mill serps and just say, "Here, we'd like to sell these." That's it, or whatever. You know, it could be Winchesters. It could be, you know, Colts. You name it. Anything it could be a bunch of assorted other guns, double guns. You name it. But uh, oftentimes, we have guys going out in the road and picking stuff up. Hmm. So that's neat. So do you have any other uh, input of, of any, any other good reasons why to it's important to determine an accurate value? You cut out there. Can you preach that one more time? Oh, I, I can't. Dan, he was trying to say, can you, do you have any other reasons why it would be a good idea to term, determine an accurate value? Just resale, you know, that's, that's the short answer. I guess resale. we got to know what this stuff's worth so you don't get short-ended, you know? Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, we'll move on to... Uh, the next one, yeah. which is factors we use to determine value, and yeah. I like I like how you broke this down, Aaron. I'm looking at yeah. the the thing you sent me. I sent it to Mark the... too, so he 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 wasn't surpri- surprised by this either. Yeah. Um. So, so it's like, go ahead, Danny. Well, so it's it's broken down into basically like three main categories, like three determining factors. Yeah. Mill serves. Yeah. So the um, the first main category would be condition. I think I think Which that is... most people in any kind of collecting area hobby conditions like ninety percent conditions of, king yeah of your of your value right Mark I would say so depends on the gun though I yeah obviously I... there's exceptions but I would say the conditions the majority of the time going to be what's going to keep your value up or down I would say the I would say demand I mean. I, 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 demand on a certain gun really drives the interest. I mean, they made millions of K98s, but that's one of and millions of grands. But yes. That's, and, no, and, and, you and know, we'll get to that. Uh, okay, we'll go ahead. We'll get to that, Mark. We'll get to that. All right. Well, I was going to bring up your Siamese guns and how rare some of them are, but... Yes, I, I have... So, what's here's, here's a funny... We'll get to that in a second, because I, I don't want to say that, because that's going to be one of my examples. Um, so, as far as what to look for on a condition i have um the three the three main factors for condition would be metal uh obviously any of the metal the blue the blue the rust if there's any pitting uh which is where rust has started to eat away at the metal and it looks like little dots or little pits in the metal uh some people might not know what that means uh, or if it's been modified, if it's been refinished, or it's been cut, like they would cut down barrels for sporterizing, or uh, the overall wear of the metal, um, blue is gone, or if you can't see any of the markings because it's just worn down. 
And most of the, most of this stuff uh, applies to the secondary, which is the wood, which is your stock and handguard. Um, the, if it's cracked, if it's missing, a lot of handguards go missing. A lot of stuff goes missing on these. Um, uh, modified, obviously cut and refinished, uh, and wear. Uh, a lot of wear on uh, stocks, uh, so most of the time any kind of stamps are hard to make out. So it, a crisp stock cartouche, as Danny likes to say, is very desirable, right Danny? Yeah, I mean, I they, they definitely add something, and it depends on the gun, but, you know, sometimes the, you know, the stock cartouche is kind of the only thing that can let you know, like, what year that gun was accepted, like on a lot of French stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, they're neat, they're good looking, you know, they're, you know, historical little uh, facets. And, and I think everybody like the, you know, the, the wood is kind of, the, you know, the first thing that you look at when you look at a mill serp. Yeah, it's the first thing you see. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, you know, you could have, you could have a gun that's, you know, the metal's in really, really good shape. Everything's perfect on the metal, but the, the wood could just be dry or rough or, you know, just kind of look like a little bland, kind of like it looks pale. Or you can have a gun that's a little bit more rough, like the metal's a little bit more worn, but the stock is like that beautiful dark brown, you know, beautiful wood color, you know, and it, that's going to be the gun that people are going to grab for, you know, more. They're going to want the the gun with the prettier stock than like the, the better metal. Or, or, uh, my favorite thing, tiger stripes. Oh yeah, my, well, I want to say a few stripes. things. If that's oh yeah, sure, Mark. Me, yeah, of course. One thing that really drives the value down is if anything's been done post service, like the stock's been sanded, somebody steel wool and cleaned the hell out of the metal. Yes. Um, if it's been lightly bubbled in any way, kind of going along what you guys said about shortening the barrel or sporterizing, but that really kills the value. I don't have a problem with honest wear on a gun. Mm -hmm. If it's eighty percent and it lost its finish on the eastern front, that's fine. Does that kind of make sense? Yes, that makes sense. Yeah, that's what I was going for. Um, something I I would like to bring up though, and that you guys might Still be able there? to. Still there? Can you? We can hear you. Can you hear me, Mark? Uh oh. Can you guys hear me? I hear you. Oh, he just dropped okay, out. Okay, he dropped out. Okay, he's trying to come back in, that guys. Mean... He's, as we said, Mark is on the moon. This was on the part <laughs> that that was uh, cut out, but Mark is on the moon, so his internet is garbage. <laughs> what happened? Yeah. You're on the moon. Yeah, you're no. basically on the moon out there in Maine. I suppose, but did you get all that stuff I said about? Conditions? Yes, we did. We yeah, heard yeah, everything. We did. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, and I, I also, agree with you. I'm the I, same way. I, I also want to say configuration. Like, has the gun been updated? I don't know for whatever modifications it went through in its service life. You know, obviously something like an 1886 Lebel that hasn't been updated to 93 specs is going to be a very desirable gun versus one that's been rebarreled in 1936 and it's got, got the end ball and all that yes another example would be an unupdated 1892 or 1894 uh crag the, the u.s crags when they're not updated oh my god they go for crazy money i have a friend that has a couple with a cl the, cl the original cleaning rod yeah and i mean you go you find i have my 1898 and that model you can find for under a thousand dollars pretty easily you get you get into nut, nuts money when you get up into an unupdated ones. I believe they're about five five grand or more. Yeah. For just for it being less less optimized. But that's what drives this market. I mean, that's what it is. I know. I get it. I get it. Okay. Um, something I get asked a lot actually is, um, and I'm sure you guys have been asked this too, is that how do you tell if something like especially wood has been refinished, and uh, I think the key thing to look for is uh, if you if you can see it in person, that's that's a lot better. Um, you can feel it; it'll feel smooth. If you hold it up to the light, you should be able to see scratches. It doesn't matter what grit or whatever they've used; it'll scratch the wood. Um, and then, especially if uh, if there are any markings on the wood, like uh, serial numbers or uh, cartouches. Or if it has uh, finger grooves, look around where it would be, where there should be sharp edges, and if it's worn down, that's a very good indication of it's being refinished. Um, is, you guys agree with that? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things you you have to get a good if you know if you're not in person looking at the gun, you need a good up close, you know, in focus picture of the wood, and you you should be able to see like 
you know, really small, you know, like little tiny, you know, lines and, and divots and stuff like that. Just naturally, you know, just the gr the grain of the wood. You should actually see the grain of the wood because it wasn't such a thing like the, you know, military. Most militaries didn't polish the stocks, you know, as, as much as like people, you know, like on the commercial market would want them and how much, you know, you know, Bubba's, you know, they really wanted those stocks polished. So, you know, it's. And sometimes it can be hard to tell because you can see a stock and you're like, oh, look, it's a stock and it's in good shape. It's not beat up. It's, it's nice. But then, you know, you kind of have to look at it again. And it's easier to tell, I think, on some guns and others. Um, like I think on um, on Arasaka's, it's a little bit easier to tell at a glance if a stock has been messed with or not. Um, just because I think the Japanese were kind of like minimalist what they did with the stocks, right? Like they didn't they didn't really um, do a whole lot of finishing to them. Right, Mark? Yeah, well, they have that Yurishi, but once you've seen that, you kind of get an idea how the different manufacturers look. Like Jensen guns, on the Jensen 99s, the grasping roots may look shallow because they were made that way. But on the Goya or Kokura, once you've seen what the wood looks like, you know what it is. You know, you, you, you kind of have to have experience looking at each individual gun to see what the wood looks like, too. In addition to kind of what the basic tips you guys said would be. Well, and then you also have just um, basic time. So, like a Chilean 1895, if the stock looks brand new, that's more of a red flag than something that was made in the 40s or even the 50s, you know what I mean? So you got to be like, okay, this looks really good for something that's over 130 years old. <laughs> what? That's, yeah. that's a red flag, you know what I mean? Yeah. With... Yeah, with a little asterisk for like certain like certain contract guns. Like yes, certain... there's a, there's always exceptions. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Argentine 1891 uh, rifles tend to be in really good condition. Uh, yeah. Uh, K31s tend to be in good condition. Yeah. I was, um, yeah. I was gonna say the the Venezuelans and uh, the Brazilian 1935s that you find are usually like pristine. Because they weren't used in the military, and they were just when they were bought, thrown into storage, and then they were just you know hit the surplus market like out of you know storage. So like they're usually like like perfect, especially the Brazilian 1935s. A lot of them were imported in the original crates that they were sold to Brazil in. Like Brazil just didn't open them, and then they just sold the crates. So a lot of times you have like time capsule perfect guns, but those are yeah, those are the uh, the the exception. I, I can tell you from personal experience, one that, that threw up a lot of flags for me when I first, because I've never seen one in person before, and that was a Polish M44. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I had never seen one in person before, and for those that don't know, Poland made M44s very briefly, but they're almost 100% you find them are in perfect condition, like just yeah. out of the factory. They look wrong. Every time I've seen it, I've gone... That doesn't seem right because it's it's a it's an M44. It should be beat to hell. Yeah, but it's most, in a like most, pristine most condition. Closing. Yeah, I'm looking now. They look like new baseball bats. Don't yes, <laughs> they look wrong. It looks it, my brain goes. This is wrong. Mark, do you do you understand what I'm saying? I I get what you're saying definitely because they have that that beach wood that looks. I guess it could look sanded because it's you know lighter color and. But could, you know, look, I mean, look, just look, the overall condition too. But the bluing isn't something like you'd see on a Soviet gun either. It's high quality, you know. Yeah, it's not. It's not 1943. The Germans are outside the factory, and and Gustav doesn't know how to. Uh, uh, or what's his name? <laughs> Sergey doesn't know Ivan. how. Ivan doesn't know how to uh, read, but he's he's bluing these guns, you know. Yeah, I I had a 1943 uh, Tula and. Uh, it had half the star missing. It wasn't just worn. It wasn't there. And that was a what I called a fuck it good enough stamp. Yeah. Some of those yep. guns from 43, you can see the machine marks too. They're really crude on the receiver. Yes. Yeah, the it's good enough. Get it out the door. Shoot some Germans. Uh, and then finally, I, for, I, did, I didn't mention the third thing for fact for condition, uh, which is overall. Um. Uh, there's three items in here. If if it's complete, so if it's missing anything, a lot of the times you'll wonder, you'll see if it's missing. Now I don't mean, I should be clarification here. If it doesn't mean that like a accessories like a bayonet, and a lot of the times you're going to be missing stuff like a cleaning rod if it had a cleaning rod or a clearing rod. I guess if you want to get technical on some of these. Yeah. 
Um, but I, I mean, most, most, what most people would consider to be complete would mean like the, the, it's got the bolt, it's got the trigger, it's got, you know, the stock is assembled and that kind of thing. Um, if it's been modified from the original caliber, that's not an arsenal modification. Um, so that has happened. That happens a lot with sporters. You'll have and 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 Mark knows about Arasakas. What's that? What's that uh, common one, Mark? Three hundred Savage or thirty out six. Yeah, and then what was that uh, weird uh, um, Wildcat cartridge? Two fifty seven six. It's like two fifty. Some kind of two fifty seven Roberts oddball thing. Six, yeah. Two fifty seven six five. I think. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously. This isn't the case for all guns, but um, matching numbers is a big thing, uh, especially in uh, Mausers, um, and uh, that's that carries a, a higher premium typically. Oh, very much. Now, I've also said this to people too: is that uh, a lot of a lot of people assume that because Mausers tend to to have stamps on damn near every single part, that doesn't mean the case for all the other gun manufacturers. Uh, Mark, how, how or Danny or, or Tom, how fun is it to hear somebody ask if it's a matching M1? <laughs> oh God, it happens. I like the all matching except. Well, okay. <laughs> well, we're not going to get into that because Danny gets on to me about that. <laughs> but I'm gonna I'm gonna say that the U.S. <laughs> standard was not to serialize every part like Mauser did. It was to ster- serialize one part, so it has one serial. Yeah, no, I like I like yeah, U.S. rifle M1s uh, being listed as uh, all matching M1 Garand. Yes, the one thing matches itself. Yeah, it does. I mean, it's true. It's not <laughs> wrong. It's just kind of not right either. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, but as a collector, I I enjoy all the the numbers and all the stampings that the Germans did. Yes, and, and that is it. it's it's part of the reason why it's more value to have matching items it's it's the original it's it's more rare because of the the reworks and the time period especially um uh danny or mark mark or danny uh or tom uh french stuff isn't usually serialized like that right uh the pre the pre world war 2 mos 36s i think or like a lot more than the post-war ones, as an example, right? No, I would I would say they were still serialized. I mean, even I, I had a Moss thirty-six fifty-one made in fifty-nine. Everything was serialized: the bolt, floor plate, bayonet, fore and buttstock. I think the thirty-six was the same measure uh, numbering conventions all the way all the way through. Yeah, I'm not sure because I I don't the French stuff. I don't I only have a Bertier, so uh, uh. I got one. Yeah, I was going this. I was going to say they didn't number the screws like the Germans did, but they like on a Berthier Lebel, you've got the bolt, the bolt head, numbered to the barrel, the either the floor plate, or the trigger guard, depending on the version of the Berthier, and then the stock. I think that's it. Yeah. And maybe if they had a clean, clearing rod, they would number the clearing rod too. Now, that Mark brought up a good point. Some people may not realize this, but not all of them, but most of them, Mauser uh, numbered the screws and yes <laughs> that's as ridiculous as that sounds but it's also german so we should expect it yeah, uh, yeah. but it's 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 kind of nice to be able to say all matching down to the screws yes now tom did bring up something that is a sticking point between me and danny and i think mark too <laughs> um which is all matching but now i'm the stickler of and which is funny because I don't care because my M95s are never matching because they were never serialized like that. Because whatever. But uh, the I'm a stickler for it's it's all matching or it's not matching. Danny, I, and I don't know about Mark, but I know for Danny for sure is all matching but to an extent. Right, Danny? Yes, yes. I It's to an extent as it relates to the value of the gun, right? So the, the the rule of thumb is the more numbers that match on, like, say, a Mauser, the more numbers that match, the more valuable it is, right? So, like, a gun that's a complete mismatch is not going to be as valuable as a gun that's, quote, all matching except the bolt, right? 
because that's those are pretty you know common like the you know the bolts were taken out and um you know however like all matching ex- you know and and probably a gun that's even more valuable than that is a gun that's all matching except the front screw you see what i mean so i i or think or clearing rod or cleaning rod yeah yeah or something or something like that which like if you're like it's all matching except the cleaning rod most people are going to like oh, the clearing rod or the front screw like ah whatever but it's important to to note that it's you know that that it's you know mismatched but just because the front screw you know it's is mismatched are you going to say like nope it's not a matching gun this is just a crap mix match you know like no like it's not a complete mismatched gun so like i think it's important to collectors and i think it plays an important role in like the value of the gun so i think it's you know sometimes it's important to get into like the nuance of what exactly is is matching on it and you know right now the currently used term is all matching except xyz mark i'm with you mark or tom yeah tom i'm i'm with you because like um i've seen a listings for mostly matching and that doesn't help at all mostly matching but all matching except the screw especially on a german rifle like i i it, it means a little more to me you know but people use it incorrectly and and it's mostly matching and it's just really two parts of of 12 available parts so i have in my go ahead tom no no that's I mean, a clearing rod or a screw doesn't mismatch, doesn't bother me, but what I call it all matching, probably not. But uh, it depends on the gun for me. If it's, I wouldn't buy a 1909 Argentine that wasn't all matching, but I probably would buy an early Gewehr 98 that had a few mismatched small parts. Just as an example, my, my measuring bar depends on the different gun. I have a Greek Berthier carbine cut down that's very, those are very rare, and that gun's a complete mismatch. That doesn't bother me at all. It, it just depends on the gun for me. Yes, uh, and and matching numbers can also be an indication of something is wrong or something's weird too. Because I've actually seen a couple of times K31s mismatched and like not insignificant parts, and it's like that's weird. That's a flag, right, Danny or Mark? Oh yes. So so those are yeah. the ones that are like all matching numbers is not a uh, a rarity for the K31s we should say. All matching numbers is pretty much the standard and it's, yeah. it's bad for it to be mismatched. Yeah, um so there are renumbered guns too, like the, Yes. The, the, I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like like totally wrong bolts, wrong no, no, no. magazines. I, oh, you're talking yeah, about Yeah, no. I mean like so like a like an arsenal like re, like fit piece force matching. Piece. Force matching is what you're referring to. Oh yeah, yeah. So like a, for, a forced match, uh, but it, but it's basically you know a bolt's out of spec or you know gets a part gets broke or worn or, or whatever, and uh, so it gets replaced. So like I have a K31 uh, that the bolt is like the the bolt number on top of it. It's not stamped. It's electro penciled because it was a because it was a, re, a replaced part, like an Arsenal replaced part. So it didn't go back say like all the way back to the manufacturer. Just as that like an armor's level, they. Uh, they fit a new bolt to it and then they, you know, electro penciled on top of it. And the Swedes did exactly the the same thing too. Um, but they did different, different levels of that. So like, you know, just because you see like a matching number, you know, stamped versus electro penciled can be, you know, incorrect or correct or, you know, various levels of that, even, you know, depending on the gun. So a lot of nuance, and the, the, like, yeah, it's very, very nuanced. And like the Swedes would even ground off like numbers and then restamp next to the ground off section or right on top of the ground off section. Uh, that so happens a lot with M95s jank. too, which is why I don't bother people say matching M95s. It doesn't yeah. make any difference. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, you know, like with Swedes, you can kind of look and you can see like, oh, yeah, that is the original numbers or, you know, that's got, oh, that's got the correct crown. You know, a good, that, a good example kind of... I'm just remembering of a force match. It's pretty common too on uh, Mosin M9130s. The uh, the magazine plate, the floor plate's usually force stamped or force matched. I don't know why specifically those parts are, but I noticed that quite a bit. Uh, huh. Mark, do you agree? I, I agree, but I think a lot of countries did that. The Japanese did that to a small extent. Like the early Japanese Type 38s and Type 44s were matching by assembly number. Like every part would match a number on the underside of the barrel, but not the receiver. Oh when yeah. The Goya, the Goya took them in. They would renumber the bolt. I think the safety floor plate, maybe the stock, anything else. They didn't care. They just threw it together. Yeah. Uh, the, the Germans did that to varying levels. Like I have a 
I have a Gewehr 98 that's a 1907 Spandau receiver. But every other part is Bavarian, made by Omberg. And they've renumbered every part on that gun, the handguard stock, because it was rebuilt late in the war. And that was done by a big depot. If it was done by a field depot, they might have just did a half-assed job of it. It all depends on who did the work. Yeah, yeah. And that's a good one, too. That's another, like, little, um, you know, exception, maybe, to the total the matching thing, because... Yeah, depending on the make, like my uh, my Type 38 carbine when I got it, um, it was not all matching because the numbers on the gun did not, like the ma- numbers on the bolt did not match the serial number of the gun. But in fact, it was all matching because it, it was matched by the uh, assembly number, which is underneath the receiver that you can't see unless you take off the wood. So I took the wood off and uh, all the parts match the assembly number. So it is actually an all matching gun, but it's 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 nuanced. Little tiny things. You've got to learn what you're looking at. All right, so we're going to move on to the final factor for determining value, which is um, rare. Uh, well, actually, no, the second. Second, we're we're still in. We're still we were still on the first, which was condition. The second va- va- uh, factor for determining rare, uh, value, which is rarity. Uh, and I have rarity here as uh, either low production rate, yeah. high destruction rate, or I actually just come up with one oh, yeah. uh, while we were talking, uh, which is um, uh, stamp configuration or stamps, some kind of marking that is different than nor- the norm can sometimes definitely bump that number up. We'll be talking about during the uh, trivia uh, Stern Uh Those are yep. sometimes given a premium than a regular one of the same year because it has a different stamp on it. I mean, yeah. functionally, yeah, they're true. same Gewehr 98, but it's got a different stamp, so it's rarer. Yeah, yeah. Just like just like with Swedes, you know, or like maybe a uh, like an SVT, you know, if it has an if it has that Finnish SA stamp on it, it's going to be worth more money than if it didn't have that, which is like it's the opposite of that, though, for Mosins. Well, it depends on the SVT. I mean, I've seen some there are people that will tell you there were never any brought back in World War Two. It just has to be a Finnish gun that missed the SA mark. Well, that's BS. There were guns that came back from World War II with GIs because the Germans used them. We have photos. I would personally, I think an original Russian gun is going to bring a that's matching or all matching, but the magazine, to borrow a term from earlier, is going to bring a lot more than a Finnish gun with an SA stamp. That's just a mix master. Yeah, but yeah, I, that's true. I've seen a couple, uh, you know, SVT 40s that are matching with the mag, and there's nothing Finnish about them. There's no SA. They didn't renumber the gas adjustment. But anyway, I digress. Well, and. Oh, I should say that just because something is, uh, I think the term rare gets used a lot and gets overused and misapplied a lot. Uh, I think the term rare, well, obviously we needed to talk about this because rare doesn't mean valuable. 100%. Um, rare, rare does not mean valuable. My, I so everybody knows I have a Lee Navy. That is uh, one of 15,000 produced of the second contract okay that is not as rare as my check produced m95 which was one of 5,000 which one's worth more <laughs> well we l- I, I wonder which one you think it is guys because it's going to be the lee navy but yeah, yeah. it's not as rare yeah so i think the so I think the like the the rarity factor on here is kind of the demand factor, really, like with economics. Yes, and it's just kind of like with just one one like one half of the so one side of the coin. Rarity is just one half, like you said. It's 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 it works hand in hand with the next step, which is popularity and notoriety, which is going to be it's going to be the supply and demand. Yeah. So. Uh, and Mark talked about this earlier with with even even stuff with high supply. If it has high demand, it's going to still be expensive, or it's going to still increase in value. I should say. Everybody yeah. wants a K98 with matching numbers, and like a dot forty four or a BYF forty four, probably two of the most produced Mausers in history. They're in the hundreds of thousands that year. But you take some obscure South American contract, Siamese, whatever, they're not going to bring as much money, even though they you can't find them. It's just everybody knows what a K98 is, and there's a high demand for them because of Hollywood and video games. Uh, uh, Danny has a perfect example of this. Danny, the, re- the recent video you just put up of uh, Brazil. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, like yeah, the my Brazilian 1935 short rifle. They only made uh, one thousand of them. Like, there's just only they only made one thousand. Brazil only got a thousand, and you know, there's far less of that here because um, apparently most of that contract was then like rebought by Germany, like in the 70s. Like a German importer took it most of those. So, yeah, I don't I don't think the majority of those are here. So, like, maybe hundreds are are in the states. Um, yeah, only you don't even have a big pool to begin mean. with, though. You don't have a big pool to begin with, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but I will go ahead. No. Yeah, but it's just it's it's obscure, you know. Like I could tell people, like, because I I knew how hard it was to find, and uh, they are very hard to find when you find them. But like the, I don't think the cost of them like reflects how uncommon they are, and it's just you know, like I I was super happy to get it, but like you know. I could tell I could tell twenty people it and only three would maybe understand, you know, like how how maybe uncommon they are. Well, I was gonna say, I mean, to me, the word "rare" is so overused. Like people will say, nineteen yeah. forty one Johnson's rare." I mean, you can go to any big, big auction company, like uh, any of them, and if you have five or six thousand dollars, you can come away with them. If the only thing that's separating is you is money, I wouldn't call that rare. You know what I mean? Something rare is something that only comes up couple times in a lifetime if you ask me like you know we say g43s are rare they're not that rare even the 41 maybe even the 41m you can find them with if you have the money does that make sense to you guys yeah it does yeah yeah but i get i get that and i and i understand that and and that's why you need to have the rarity and the popularity or the the well-known factor of it to go hand in hand so as far as to determine value so exa- another example, going back to my Lee Navy, I love just talking about it because I like to just bring it up because Danny doesn't have one. Um, and, <laughs> and Mark doesn't have one either, which is just weird. Um, it'll, it'll be one day. Uh-huh, uh, sure. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll revel in it at the moment. All right. Do you, do you have a Ross 1910? Let me ask you uh, hold, that. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry. Do you have an 8824 blindy conversion? But anyway, I'll go on. Well, anyway. Um. Uh, I've lost my train of thought. Oh, so 10 years ago, I looked at Lee Navies because I thought they looked cool. And they were about one and a half to $3,000, depending on accessories and condition and stuff like that. I bought mine for $2,000, which was a sweetheart deal from a friend of ours. But they do not appreciate in value as well as a K98K has because they are so rare, they don't come up to the market much, so the values don't move. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, a gun mm-hmm. can almost be too rare for its own good. Yeah. Or too scarce for its own good. Yeah, cause, so the values don't move because nobody's selling it. No, it's not trading hands. Yeah. And if it's... Yeah, there's a, there's a weird thing where like the more... I think the more common a gun is the more popular it'll be because if it's common people will talk about it and you know well i would uh, interject that because up until recently carcanos have not been expensive or valued very highly and they are well known due to obviously anytime you post one on a facebook page uh how many times you'll get references to <laughs> JFK. Uh, even oh, if God. it's even <laughs> if it's not anything to do with that, even if it's from World War, if it's a an M91 from 1910, doesn't matter. My magic bullet shooter. Or if it's a 735 gun that doesn't even make step make a difference because he didn't use one of those. Um, but I would interject that those were common, well known, but I think the issue here and I didn't put this on the thing is as far as value goes as far as those go is a lack of supply of ammunition I think that it wasn't they're not as common as far as value goes because it wasn't as common to especially 735 but even 6.5 wasn't as common to find and I think that's also why M95s have been suppressed in value is because 8x56R is not readily available and 8x50R is impossible. You can find you go 
surplus was... for a couple of dollars round if you're lucky, I guess. For what? Sorry, Mark. Uh, ch excuse me, check. You can find check surplus for a couple of dollars round if you're lucky, I guess, for eight by fifty. Yes. So, but anyway, uh, the rarity, popularity, uh, and if it's known in culture, if it's recognizable for major war use, that's going to be your two big yeah. things that keep it up in terms of value. Like I, I think popularity is, you know, probably more important to to value yes. than, than rarity. But rarity is a factor in it, and uh, especially when you get into, uh, like myself, who is trying to get all the different versions of M95s. Those are specific markings that I'm looking for, and most people wouldn't associate that with being more valuable because they don't know. Yeah, yeah. But I bet, uh, so this is kind of reshaping the definition of value, which I think Mark kind of would go along the lines with this because there's like, there's market value, which is like what, you know, everybody on, you know, that's, that's looking for a specific gun might value. But then there's like, you know, what you personally would value. Yes. And, and kind of like with Mark. Yeah, like Mark was saying about the K98Ks, that's like the that's I think that's the best example because they're they're not rare, but people will all the time will say, "Look at my rare all matching K98K," you know, and uh, and they routinely will pull bigger money than just a lot more you know scarce and uncommon guns um, that are that are really way more interesting too. Um, but I think people would just rather have a rack full of you know, K98Ks that are all exactly the same except for a couple digits stamped on the receivers than, you know, having a bunch of, you know, interesting and unique, you know, rifles from early developmental, you know, whatever. This is Danny talking about how he loves uh, South American Mausers and nobody else really cares. Yeah, which, you know what? I, I it, like it, them. <laughs> it, it works out because they're undervalued and you can actually find them for, for decent, you know, prices. So... If you're, if you're an appreciative collector, you know, and there are dozens of us, hipster, and that's a good deal. Sorry, sorry, did I say something? No, I didn't mean to. Um, all right, so before we get off way one more tangents on that, let's move on to the last last thing here, which to help you figure out um, value, I think would be a good idea is to compare sales with so I've I've um. I got a list here, which is major retailers, and I did a little note here. So remember, there's a difference between retail sale versus private sale. Uh, I think one of the big things you can see with this is everybody likes to joke about Cabela's prices. Oh god! I think I saw an M1 carbine uh, on Facebook today where a Cabela's was trying to sell it for two grand. Oh yeah, I saw that one too. So, well, the problem with that is you take one photo of an M1 carbine, don't show any more details. That could be a very well good buy, good buy for that gun, but we don't know because the person taking the photo doesn't really take detailed photos. Because True. they probably don't know. That too. Well, And unfortunately, yeah. I also don't know the, the... We assume, but we also don't know the details of the people that are pricing it to begin with. Um... A lot of the times, it is assumed the people pricing Millsurfs at a retail store like a Cabela's or, um, uh, I don't know, uh, does Bass Pro even sell guns anymore? Well, Bass Pro bought out Cabela's, but Bass Pro doesn't sell military surplus. Right, they sell right, shotguns right. and stuff. Um, anyway, like Cabela's, for example, um, the people pricing those are either not as interested in mill serps have little knowledge are 18 19 20 year old that don't care or they're more interested or have more knowledge in modern uh firearms and the pricing model would just be a cursory example of a google search of whatever this is to do it or if it's a trade-in or a a um crap what is that called when they when they sell it for you and they get a percentage Commission. consignment consignment that's it consignment a consignment typically also has a person who is consigning it their price on it which is why simpson 
is so crazy in terms of variation of value. <laughs> anyway, so we have major retailers. We have I I had on here arms list, but uh, arms list has kind of is it kind of still going? Yeah, uh, I think it is. But there's yeah. still a lot of scams on there, which yeah. probably shocks yeah, you all. Yeah, still are. And you, I found out the other day, you can't send somebody a link to an arms list on Facebook Messenger. Yes. Well, arms a list. Friend of, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, my friend of mine, I was cruising Facebook one day. I was asking if this Caverna nugget was a good buy. Well, come to find out one of my good friends owned the gun. <laughs> and I, obviously it was a scam. That's funny. Uh, it's good. That's good. You knew. Yeah, like you could tell him definitively. Yeah, was it an arms list thing? It was. It, it was. It was an arms list gun because I, I. I. Sure enough, there was the serial number, and I. My friend Chris owned it. Yeah, you just got to be so careful. You know, I did. I did a video on arms list scams and like how not to get scammed. But uh, you know, and I've heard from quite a bit of people that like, hey, you know, it's it's always fine. I I deal. You know, I deal with there all. I deal there all the time, and it's fine. But I think meeting in person with him is the is the key. Yeah, and I've noticed a lot of the recent in the last six months, uh, well, before COVID, I should say, um, listings would say will not ship meet in person only. And that's I think yeah. people selling that are legit sellers that are like I'm not going to ship this anywhere because I'm not going to deal with that. Yeah. Well. It's it goes both ways, right? Because you could be trying to sell something on there, and you can get scammed as well. You can get yes. sent, you know, a, a bad check, or there's that classic um, little thing that they'll try to do, which is, hey, cool, I want to buy this gun from you for five hundred dollars, but I'm gonna send you a check for a thousand dollars. So if you would just go ahead and cash that check and uh, send me the, you know, the gun and five hundred dollars, and then you can, you know. Which of course it's a bad check. It bounces, and then the person gets hit for the for the thousand dollars. So they just gave their gun away and gave the person five hundred bucks. Horrible. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's why so I don't recommend arms list for most things. Yeah, yeah. Which, like, on the flip side of that, um, I mean, I've seen a I've seen a couple shady listings on Gunbroker, but like nine point nine percent. Like, I think it's I think Gunbroker has a really good system, especially with yeah. the ratings. You know. If you see a seller on there that's you know NR no ratings, they're they're probably sketch. The that was actually my next one was gun broker and to be sure to check closed listings, not open listings. Oh yeah, that's a big that's a big pet peeve of mine, man. Like because very often people will <laughs> you know if you're like you know arguing value or something with with somebody you know like especially if you're trying to sell something and they'll send you a screenshot of like an ongoing auction and see that low price. It's like, Oh, cuts both ways. I mean, you could find one that's uh find something that's insanely priced and not moving. Yeah. And, and I mean, people do get great deals on gun broker. Um, I have myself, I, my, um, my M 1886 was $300 by it now. Um, yeah. Then that's yeah. like, that's, that's not a thing that doesn't happen. And I just happened yeah. to see it. There's, yeah, there's, I, I would say like when you look at the listings, the buy it now, like if a listing comes up with a buy it now, I don't think that's a great, um, I mean, it, it can kind of be, but I don't think it's a great one to look at for value because that buy it now, if it's sold for buy it now, that was below market pretty much. Like nobody, nobody clicks the buy it now unless that's, you know, you know, correct. Equal or, unless it's or below or market. Less. Yeah. Or so, unless they really, really want it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, probably most of the time. Um, you know, and and every now and then I see, like, I'm kicking myself for not buying a Sour 38H that popped up. And it was only on there for, like, 12 hours. And I had a, it was a, it was a great, it's it's a rare, it's a comma, it's a comma gun. Because it has, like, a comma in between, like, the, the letters on the slide. But it's, um, they had to buy it now of five ninety nine. I just I you know I looked at it for too long and it it got it got bought right in front of me. But you know that doesn't mean that that's how much those go for five ninety nine. Obviously, which I'm kind of been getting into a uh, sour thirty eight H kick here lately. You seem to be getting into a thirty two pistol kick. Yeah, it's a rabbit hole that won't end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was talking to, I was talking to Mark about that. I think when I first was getting sucked into it, 
There's a lot of different 32s out there. That's all I can say. Yeah. I saw a 38H sell. It had the original box. It was like the 4,000s. It was in the first 4,000 4, made. Then had the original box with like, because the box has a serial number and all the accessories and everything. It was like beautiful. Uh, and it sold for like four grand or something like that. Oof. I suppose I'm not shocked. Condition, like we talked about earlier, when you get uh, when you get with pistols, the upper condition really multiplies the price. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's what I found exactly with with 38 H's. It's it's like mostly condition with them for for value. But I know there are some variations of the 38 H. You bring a lot more like late war. There was one in the army had the I think it had two 37 stamps. Those bring stupid money too. Oh yeah, yep. But what was I going to say? But I think in this market right now, we got a lot of new guys. They jump in head first. They have a lot of money to spend. They look at a gun because it's pretty, and they they have to have it. They have to have it right now, and it goes nuts on gun broker. Like the other day, there was a M95 Bulgarian reefer went for eighteen hundred and seventy five dollars, which is ridiculous. And uh, I mean that that was like a three hundred dollar gun two or three years ago, but. The guy had to have it because he thought it was nice looking, but they, they, they you have to do your yeah. research in this business. I know the one you're talking about. It was an, it was nice looking. That's that's the that's the thing. Is it it didn't look like garbage. That's the only like advantage of it. But going off what we said earlier about condition, I'd rather have a gun that has a little bit of little bit of battle scars. You know it was there. You know what I mean? Yeah. I prefer some. I prefer it to be matching, obviously, but something that has a little bit of wear, but just enough so you know it was there. How bad. Yeah. Of a condition rifle, do you purchase if it's something you really wanted? Do you? How much do you accept? It depends on the gun. That's the short answer. Yeah, yeah. If it's a gun that like there's only three in the United States, then like yeah, you know, you can take a real rough one because there's only three of them. Something yeah. like a K9. Your average wartime K98. Let's say eighty percent bluing, maybe seventy five percent bluing original. That makes uh, sense. For me, something that I know that I would like to get is a, a, what's called an AOI M95, which is an Italian-issued uh, M95 rifle to their uh, colonies in North Africa. Those are typically in garbage condition, like really bad. Um, and like, I'd be happy with pretty much any condition getting one. So it comes down to demand again. So if you want it bad enough. Yeah. 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 It's funny how, like, how many things in our lives just goes back to, like, basic economics of supply and demand, you know? Like, it's. When they used to collect uh, baseball cards, they used to say, if it's, if people, it's rare if people care. Just, if people care about it, it's going to be worth something. But if it's rare and no one cares, no one, it's it's worth nothing. Exactly. (laughs) That's it. But also, everybody's got their own personal preferences, too. Like, as we said earlier, value can be kind of subjective on your own personal preference. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the majority of what I um, I had for my uh, outline. Yeah. Um, I, I ahead, came yeah. up with, like, a, a general sort of, like, formula based on that, which I don't, I don't know how you'd rank this. So I'm, I'm thinking of, like, um, like, a rarity skill or scale and then like a uh, popularity scale of like one to 10 and then a condition scale, like, you know, something, something along the lines of that. Um, So it would be like value equals rarity times um, popularity uh, divided by condition. So if it's like a, you know, like an eight, then it, then it goes down according to that or maybe minus condition, something like that. So then it'd be the opposite. If it was an 80% gun, then you'd put it as a 2, so then it's minus 2, mm. so minus 0. Anywho, got a formula I've been thinking about. Quadratic formula. But I think the market today, people perceive this stuff to be rare, and they go on gun broker. You've got, like I said, you've got to know your stuff, particularly with anything Third Reich. That's the worst. And then they get burned. They want a K98 with matching numbers, but they spend three grand only to find out it had been messed up. Somebody had been renumbered it. I don't even forget about the classic K98K scam, which is what well, SS. They, they, oh god! <sighs> yeah, anything SS is. I mean, there's legit SS stuff out there, but you got to know what you're looking at. Yeah, but that's the classic scam. 
Yeah. When I when I see it, I just I just think, oh, that's fake. Like just automatically, I'm like, yeah, it's fake. Like if it was real, that wouldn't be here. That would be in somebody's, you know, that'd be in somebody's collection somewhere. Well, some of that SF stuff is common. Like I said, you've got to know what it is. Like the rune guns, the I, mean, I shouldn't say common, but they're not super rare. But you got to make sure it's fake. There are the Gewehr 98 conversions SS guns out there. They're not super rare, but they're not super common either. But it is out there. You've got to know what you're looking at. But like we talked about earlier with online distributors, people perceive we, we're raised on a generation of convenience. We expect to go on Amazon and get what we want at, at, at a click of a button. So they think mill SERPs are rare, but you've got to put some patience into it. The best resource you have, I mean, other than books and the, and the Internet, is your buddies. You've got to build a network. It's a two-way street. You've got to help them. They've got to help you. And how, that's... Oh, go ahead. And how amazing it is that these sites you're purchasing, you're not even seeing the pictures of the actual firearm. Yeah, you I would always recommend 100% on that. faith. I always recommend not doing that. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. I did... I blind bought my, uh, my Brazilian 1935. I will admit I did that for my M95, my first one. I did for a Carcano, but... Nothing expensive. To be fair, my M95 when I first bought it was $125, so yeah. Yeah, no. The yeah, the 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 1935 I got was it was it was pretty expensive, but I still like I knew 1935s are are typically, you know, really, you know, really good condition. So I just uh you know, like I like I said, there's only been like a few like th- those are hard to value because when you go and look at sold like sold auctions or anything, you can't find the carbines. Like they just don't oh, yeah. come up, and I, I've been I've been you know looking like for uh, you know for for a couple of years now for a, for Brazilian 1935 carbine specifically for to come up, and so I don't know if that that meets your um, your definition of of rare mark if it if it only comes up every or you knew you said a couple a lifetime like only a couple in a lifetime I think is what you said. I think that, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I haven't paid enough attention to Brazilian 1935 carbines to say... <laughs> That's a very specific <laughs> niche. Yeah, yeah. And it's a weird it's a weird thing, like a road, how I got to them. Only, like, just purely based on features. Like, I think just all the features of a bolt action, I think the Brazilian 1935 might be, like, the closest to perfect. Um, just the, the combination of factors of it. So it's like a weird mix of utilitarian appreciation. The perfect short rifle. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's shorter than a short rifle because oh, you know, yeah. like, um, you know, like Ken Andy at K's got like a little over 20, 24 inch barrel, and this one's got a little over a twenty one inch barrel, which is you know it's kind of similar to like a Moss thirty six in length. That it's it's kind of that sweet spot where I think a lot of even short rifles are kind of like too too long a little bit like by today's standards, and a lot of the carbines are probably too short. Like eighteen inches is probably too short. I see. But uh, what was I going to say? I'm trying to think of a gun that I would consider rare, truly rare. We had one gun at uh, Amoskeg when I worked there. I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation of it, but it's called the Roestling Roestling Con- Condors. It was a German Volkstrom prototype gun. There are two in existence: one at Springfield Armory. This this is the other one, the only one that I know of in private hands. There could be another one out there, but who knows? That I would call rare. Yeah. What about the, um, didn't, uh, Ian did a video on the, uh, that, the M1 that was before the thirty out six took over, whatever caliber it was before that? Oh, he's gone again. <laughs> he's Move. back. He's back. That's, I, that thing, thing cuts him out, but anyway. What was the, what was the M1 in before it was the thirty out six? Two seven six Patterson. Right. Didn't uh... that was one of my que- other questions that I didn't give you guys. <laughs> that was uh, Ian. Ian did a video with one of those, didn't he? On forgotten Probably. weapons. Probably. But there were a lot of different variations of the Grand before they went into production. I think around nineteen nineteen, he made one with a detachable mag. Right. It was like a BAR mag, right? I believe so. But he experimented with the primer actuation quite a bit before he settled on what became the Grand. Took him, I think, about 18, 20 years to get the gun right. No, probably, yeah, right around 20 years, depending on which way you measure it. Which is, it's pretty nuts that, like, a developer had that long. You know, it's very it's very rare that a developer has that long to keep working on one design, you know? 
But what's amazing about Grand Garand, however you want to pronounce it, is he made the he made the tooling because he was a tool and die maker for Brown and Sharp. He made the tooling that would create all the parts for the Grand rifle, so they could get into production. A lot of that stuff was obviously pretty advanced for 1936, 37. I don't know of any other gun designer that can say that. Yeah, that he that he made the parts or the machines to make his own gun. Exactly. Uh, no, probably not. Like literally. I know Johnson was pretty crazy. Yeah. Well, Johnson I don't know. operated on a shoestring budget. I think he had a loan of $10,000, which even in those days wasn't much. But he he got the idea, I believe, of taking like a brown, mating a, the idea from the browning, the recoil system. Yeah. What he, what he did was quite amazing, too, based on the limited budget and limited resources he had. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, his like prototype gun that he had uh, some like... He had some machine shop workers put together for him, and he like he he paid him like all the money that he had, I think, for this like one really crude prototype gun that didn't even have a magazine. It's basically just like a single shot, but it had his you know his bolt in it, and uh, yeah, that's that's all where it started, just like a proof of concept. And yeah, he did it very fast. Like that was a very fast turnaround time. But like that guy like he really burnt like in his life that he really broke burnt the candle on both ends because he had a lot going on he was an officer in the marines did a bunch of stuff yeah and then invented that and then like just just a rifle would be fine right like he in just a couple years he, he comes up with this you know new semi-auto rifle design which is something that like whole countries couldn't really you know figure out on their own but this guy you know did it as well as he was you know making other stuff like like machine guns which is it's kind of uh kind of insane that he could that he could come up with both of those but um i think probably the biggest the biggest shortcoming of the, you know the uh of uh, of Garand and Johnson is just the uh the the, the military not wanting a you know a box magazine on the on their infantry rifle that's it it's always Part. back to requirements isn't it Danny we had the whole podcast on it yeah yeah requirements that ruined rifles which it's so crazy that you know the the M1 it's so it's so easy to modify an M1 to take a BAR mag like it's well they developed the T20 at the end of World War II which I th- that was a select fire grand they were going to put them into production if we invaded mainland Japan but I think that played a big role in nixing the program and then obviously they didn't come up with it until years later uh, with the M14 I mean, you do have Italy, though, with the BM-59, right? Isn't that what that yeah. is? Yeah. That, that's, that's an M1, isn't it? It's just converted to 7.62 with the box mag? That's all it is, I believe. I am not sure what the other differences are. Yeah. Yeah, the first, uh, the first Johnsons all had, like, straight box magazines. Well, there was a grand prototype that had a rotary mag like the Johnson too. It's in, they have one in the armory in their collection. Yeah, supposedly... It, it, in the in the Johnson book that I was reading, it's it's kind of like where he gets his ideas from. Like I don't I don't know if I trust it hundred percent, like what the what the book says. But like he said he got the idea from of the magazine from the crag, and he got the idea of the bolt from a uh, like the spokes on a wheel. Hmm. Um but I know that I think there's like a, an artillery piece or something that had like a multi lug bolt. Um kind of similar to you know like we'd recognize it as like johnson or an ar bolt like today um but they you know all those lugs yeah yeah so like i don't you know who knows and, and then there's cases of you know simultaneous invention and you yep know. that's why uh that's why lee sued mon liquor <laughs> <laughs> what about true? the mon the mondrogan the mon- semi-auto Drogan. or of 1908 or so was it he had a M- Modelo 1908. Oh, um, Mondra- yeah. Mondra- Mondragoon. What is his name? Mond- Mondragoon, I believe. Mond- Mondragoon. Mond- I don't know how you say it for sure. <laughs> but when I was doing my questions here, he he had one in 1908, which is a long time before. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a weird thing, like semi-auto production. It kind of was waiting around smokeless, I think. Like most like automatic guns. It wasn't just like... smokeless though. It was also a uh, consistent powder manufacturer and consistent manufacturer of the yeah. rounds. Yeah. Well, that was, I mean like that was sort of like the the I think the like the first step I was like okay, like we, you know, smokeless, then after that, yeah, then consistent case manufacturing. Um 
smaller bore I think helps. Because I have a book behind me of Monlicker prototypes, and he has patent drawings for a full auto LMG in 11 millimeter Verndal black powder that looks just like a um, a Bren gun. It's got a gravity fed magazine on the top, but it's 11 millimeter Verndal, and it's that's literally limited because of the of the a cartridge uh, technology. Yeah, I think the first Maxims were black powder, weren't they? Yep. Yeah. I think I think they made some in five seven seven four fifty. Man, imagine all that smoke. That thing just God. looking like a dragon, just puffing out smoke. Watching bowling balls fly out. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and uh, I think we'll wrap it up here. Yep. Yep. Um, sorry, everybody, that you didn't hear the trivia that happened. In the first hour of the unrecorded. Yeah, I was very intelligent. <laughs> um, and Danny didn't know what he was doing. It's... Hey. All right. <laughs> that, I don't need crickets. I already got them in my house. <laughs> Thank right. you, guys. But we'll definitely have Tom back on again, for sure. And Mark. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> you don't want to lose trivia again, do you? <laughs> yeah, that's true. We need Nobody knows. It's he all the king. nobody knows. Well, appreciate it, guys. Oh, well, have a good night, gentlemen. Yes, thank you all for coming. And uh, uh, Mar- uh, Tom, what was your uh, address again for your uh, website? Oh, millserphq.com. All right. Uh, be sure to check him out and check us out on uh, anywhere you get your podcast. Obviously, you're listening to this. You know what that is. Uh, and then uh, check us out on Danny's YouTube channel, which is Millsurp World, and your Instagram, Danny? Yep, yep. Uh, Mills, Millsurp yep. World at, at Instagram, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know Instagram. And, yeah, I don't know. I'm on there. I just I just mostly shit post memes. And, and uh, I am on Reddit. I am. I you'll see me in the Millsurp subreddit and on sometimes the Gun subreddit. The Gun subreddit is way more modern stuff, but I'm more on the Millsurp subreddit. Danny very rarely gets on Reddit. Yeah, I don't. I don't know why I don't get on there more, but I don't. All right. Thank you all, and have a good night.